<laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. We're very excited with uh, the program that we have to offer you tonight. Um, this is a joint presentation between the Adirondack Experience and um, the Adirondack Diversity Initiative. My name is Laura Rice. I'm the Chief Curator at the Adirondack Experience. And I'd like to start this evening's program by acknowledging that the Adirondack Diversity Initiative's home office is on Wabanaki and Abenaki lands. And the Adirondack Experience is situated on the Aboriginal territories of the Mohawk and Abenaki communities. Indigenous people continue to live in this region and practice their teachings and life ways. Both ADI and ADKX are thrilled to continue this uh, tradition of collaboration with tonight's presentation, Creative February Daily Painting, part of ADKX's monthly Artists and Inspiration series. This evening's speaker is Takis Walter. Takis is an award-winning painter whose works are held in the Adirondack Experience Collection. She's recently featured in the Lake Placid Center for the Arts exhibition. Ah, my computer's not scrolling. Here we go. She was recently featured in the Lake Placid Center for the Arts exhibition, Big Little Show, and has had her work on view at other exhibitions there and throughout the Adirondacks. So welcome to Keith. We're very excited and I now turn it over to you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. And um, thanks to everyone who is joining us this evening. Um, as Laura mentioned tonight, um, I am going to be completing my 28th painting <laughs> for Creative February. Um, Creative February is a project that started um, eight years ago um, as an artist and a mom with, with young kids. I was trying to find some some balance um, to try to kind of reinvigorate my artistic time <laughs> because that time was limited um, that year and, and years previous. So uh, my birthday is in February. And that year I told my husband that the only gift that I wanted <laughs> really was time to create art, but every day during my birthday month. And it was, you know, we, we we kind of laugh about it now because um, I don't think any of us expected it to grow. Now in its eighth year, we are, um, it's because, instead of being just a personal project, it's become more of a community project. We have um, invited and opened it up to other artists. Um, we have a Facebook group where other artists are painting, they're doing poetry, um, they're um, weaving, printmaking and sharing it um, each day um, throughout the month. So um, I've done, each week I've, I've had kind of like a theme in mind. The first week, I the focus was on skies and clouds. Second week, I did um, lakes. So lakes that my family and I visit, uh, many in the Adirondacks over the summer, um, to the lake in our backyard where we go fishing and swimming. Um, and then this, the third week, um, my focus was on close to home. So I did a plein air, well, plein air from my studio window. <laughs> we, my studio overlooks the marshes of Round Lake. And I did um, a pastel of the moon, the snow moon that rose a couple of weeks ago and the stream that I pass on my daily walks. And this week, the theme has turned out to be, you know, I, kind of, I don't really start the week with uh, an intent, it just whatever kind of strikes me over a couple of days, the theme usually reveals itself. So this week, I've been focusing on lakes in the Adirondacks. So um, I'll show, share a couple of pieces that I've done this week. This is one that has been really popular. <laughs> this is um, Lake George on a brilliant summer day, the blue really was that intense. Um, and I think a lot of people can relate to that, you know, to those unbelievably blue moments on the water. Um, and then this is one that I had completed for 
the first week when I was focusing on the skies, that is actually um, Round Lake, which is in my backyard. So just some storm clouds kind of rolling through. This is another that I did that also features Round Lake, a sunset on Round Lake. You can see that. And so far this week, again, I've been working on memories of um, some time, some waterways in the Adirondacks. This is one that I did for a couple of days ago. This is the brook, um, Eagle Brook, I think it's called, that runs alongside Route 73 um, on the way to Keene Valley. And today, I'm especially for this session, I'm going to be doing a painting of Blue Mountain Lake. Um, this is the reference image that I'm working from. Let me see if I can get that up here. So this is a very soft sunrise. Um, so that's what we're gonna be working from today. And I'm working with gouache and pastel. So I kind of prepped a little bit before we got started and did the, the, the gouache underpainting. And so that way it would be dry. And I know we have an hour, so I'm gonna to try to get this to as close to completion as possible with the time that we have together. So allow me to just switch my camera around and then I'll show you my um, easel, my workspace. So hopefully everybody, everybody can see that. Um, this is my pastel paper that has the gouache underpainting. You can kind of see where I'm going with this. I have this mountains are kind of the clouds are the mountains are emerging from the clouds. There's a lot of soft colors um, in the reflection and some really nice light in the sky. And if anyone has questions while I'm working, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Laura and the fabulous team that's not on camera will, will get them to me. Um, so before I start typically with um, a painting, I do a little sketch. So this is, this is a sketch from the piece that I did last night. And then on the other side is a little thumbnail sketch of this piece that we're doing tonight. The sketches, I, I like to do them because I think of it as practice. So anytime that like, I need to work out composition, these little thumbnails are great for doing that. And they're also just a good reference to keep close by while I'm working. So I can just kind of double check my composition to make sure that I'm capturing the things that I feel that are important for the piece. Um, so let's get started. This paper that I'm working on is a um, sanded paper. So it really kind of, um, I'm really happy with it. I mean, actually this month it's, it's helped me kind of change the way I work. Um, typically I used to do like a really bright underpainting with either like an, or like a warm color, which would be a complement of what was going on top. Um, but this month I wanted to do some experimentation with different media and I tried gouache and I, I tried the gouache with doing like the bright colors underneath. And then I tried to do just, you know, a, a wash with similar local color to what would be on top. And I actually like, really like the effect that that has. So I'm, I'm going to be exploring more of that in my um, other pastel work and also in my oil painting. So let's get started. Um, yes. Could you maybe explain to to our uh, participants what gouache is? Yes, <laughs> gouache is an opaque watercolor. So it's similar to watercolor, and it's um, similar to acrylic, except it's it's kind of sits someplace in between. It doesn't have a plastic binder like acrylic does. Um, but it does have a binder that makes it opaque. So you, with gouache, it's really versatile. You can do very thin washes like you, you see here, but you could also build up your layers. Um, and it also has white paint, which 
With watercolor, typically you're going from light to dark. With gouache, you can go from dark to light and then from light to dark. Um, I really am just in love with it. And the, the kit that I have, I'll have to share is with you. Again, it's really messy <laughs> because it's been a busy month. Um, but here are the colors. You can see I need to replace my white already because I've used a lot of that. Um, but it's really a, a great set. These are called gel gouaches. Um, and it's just been a lot of fun to kind of discover and, and play with them. And the pastels that I'm using, they are um, called soft pastels, even though they're come in a variety of softness, I guess, and hardness. This is probably some of the hardest um, ones that I have. And I also have some new pastels, which are pretty, um, you can see is pretty tough to break. And I also have some really soft ones that are, um, you know, if you just look at them, sometimes they, they break and they shatter. Um, I usually save those towards the end um, of the painting. So let's get started on here. Um, I like to work from the top down after I've kind of established my lights and darks. So let's get a dark in for this area, which is the darkest area in the piece. Case, we have another question. Um, she sure. says, thank you for this wonderful class. How do uh, you do the water <laughs> reflections on the painting behind you? This is always a challenge for me. Oh, <laughs> uh, this, um, the painting behind, that was behind me was a, an oil painting of the Hudson River. And um, just lots of layers. <laughs> There's layers there and um, I try to spend as much time as possible observing um, my subject matter. So I, I am so intrigued by water and reflection. And I, we're on the lake as much as possible during the summer. Um, as soon as it's warm enough to get out there and as soon as the lake is uh, not frozen, we do go out when it's frozen for ice fishing and ice skating, but um, spending a lot of time just observing and making notes has been really helpful to me to then take my notes back to the studio and then um, kind of practice and, and work on the reflections. Um, I do studies at times. I'll take my um, watercolor paper out with me um, or my, my, I have a small oil kit um, that I take out in the field as well. And I'll do little studies of the waves, um, of the light on the water. And the studies aren't meant to be, you know, finished paintings. They're literally just studies. Like I'm studying how um, the light refracts and bounces off of the waves and the different planes. So there's, um, there's no shortcut, you know, to direct observation. I'll show my palette when I'm done so you can kind of see where I'm pulling all of these beautiful pastel sticks from. It's getting away. And you'll see that I, I start off as, um, as broad as possible. Like I start off making large, I guess marks. I was going to say brush strokes, but not technically brush strokes since I'm not using a brush. Um, but I try to make the marks as big as possible to just kind of get a sense of color down. And then I can always come back and, and finesse and 
adjust, make adjustments as needed. So we have another question. Sure. Um, also says, thank you. How are you thinking about balancing the coolness versus the warmth and all the variety of blues you have in the subject? Um, that's a really good question. <laughs> so I, I kind of let the um, my reference image and my memory of the place kind of dictate which colors I choose. Um, typically, looking at my reference photos, this is a pretty um, cool image, even though you know it's kind of like a soft sunrise. There aren't a lot of like reds or oranges in this image, even though it was fall and there was, it was just, there's just a little bit of turning happening here. Um, but it's, yeah, so it's a pretty cool image and I try to make sure that the temperature of the color that I'm choosing kind of matches what's going on with the light. So another question is asking, do you plan your colors ahead of time or do you choose them as you go, as you're working? Most times I choose them as I go. If I were more efficient, I probably would kind of come up with like a little um, palette. But I, I like the excitement of kind of problem solving as I go along. Um, That's a part of the, um, the fun for me. And this, this paper is really forgiving. So because it's sanded, I can um, kind of layer things. If, some, if I don't like something, I have a brush nearby. I could just grab a brush and kind of brush it out. Um, but the, yeah, I, I really enjoy working with this paper because of that flexibility you kind of put something in and if it doesn't work you can go over it or um, you can layer so a lot of times I may not have the exact color that I'm looking for but layering kind of helps accomplish the color that I need So someone's asking, what is the name of the paper? I assume perhaps a uh, brand name? Yeah. Yes, the, the, um, the name of the paper is U Art. So the letter U the, and then the word art. That's the name of the paper. That's the name of the company um, that makes it. And essentially it's a, it's a sandpaper. It's a sandpaper with a very fine grit. The paper that I'm using right now is um, a grit 400. So it comes just like sandpaper does. There's two, I think 280, there's 240, um, there's um, 400, 500, 600, and 800. And typically I use the 500 grit, the 500 or 600 grit, but I ordered this 400 and I, Absolutely love it. It just takes the pastel so nicely. One thing to keep in mind if you do use this paper is that you have to be gentle in your application. You can kind of see, um, you know, if I, the, this was a round pastel and as I work, it kind of becomes a little bit squared. So if I did like a really aggressive mark, it would probably chew this down to half the stick. Um, so I am have a very light touch in how I'm um, applying the pastel. And that helps you to, to not, eat. while this paper is very, um, it's toothy and it can, it can hold a lot, if I, 
you know, put too much pressure, then I can fill up that tooth too early on in the process. And generally, I don't need to um, to like finger blend. Just just the act of kind of pulling the pastel across the paper kind of softens things if I need it to. So uh, one of our participants says it's it's very gutsy that you're wearing a light color. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I did not think about that before coming out today. Um, usually I have my coat on and actually I'm gonna turn off my heat. I had, um, usually I have my coat on because my studio is in my backyard and um, we don't run the heat all the time. I just kind of put it on when I'm coming out. And it gets rather chilly in here. Um, so my coat, I usually have to wash like a couple of times, a few times a week um, to get rid of all of the pastels. So we, we have another question. Um, she's asking, do you have a pre-planned focal point? Yeah, with this one, um, the focal point for me is kind of right in this area where the light is protruding from. So where the mount, so typically I like to have a focus be um, an area that has high contrast. So here, you know, this little land mass here is really dark and then you have that um, beautiful light coming from behind it. Um, most times I try to plan the paintings out if I'm doing um, like a more finished larger piece, there's a lot more planning that goes into them. Um, for Creative February in this project in particular, um, I've done, I mean, other than this little sketch. There hasn't been a huge amount of planning that goes into it. I, I really wanted the time to be spent um, playing and exploring. And if a uh, piece, you know, turned out to be good, then that was kind of like a, a bonus for me. Um, but the primary goal was to explore and, and create without um, a lot of prescriptive um, thought, I guess, going into it. I love the shape of this mountain. It has like a little top. Very distinctive. So we have another comment. Um, mm -hmm. It says the water, the smooth rhythm of small ripples is so beautiful and soft. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's what I, what I love about this image um, and this memory. You know, it was a beautiful morning. I had actually 
um, had an exhibit in the Adirondacks um, and at the Adirondacks Lake Center for Art. And we stayed at this beautiful place overnight because um, the opening, the reception was at night. So we didn't want to drive back and we stayed at uh, a place in, in Blue, on Blue Mountain Lake. And I brought my paint supplies and I was so happy to wake up early. I'm, and if you know me, I don't usually like, I'm usually a night owl. So I don't usually get up early for a lot of things. Um, but I was thrilled to wake up and, and catch the sunrise here. Um, and it was just, it was, it was a really soft morning. You heard like the water lapping on the rocks, on the shoreline. And I did a, a couple um, plein air pieces that morning. So we have a couple more questions. Uh, sure. Was the water done in watercolor or pastel? Yeah, so um, the way the image was before I started doing pastel, um, that was the gouache underpainting. So all of this will eventually be covered by pastel. Um, so I mentioned before that typically um, when I work with pastels, I, you know, kind of gotten into a, a process, you know, like a groove of how I do things. And this year for Creative February, I really wanted to kind of stretch myself and, and try some new things. And one of the things that I decided, I started, like well, I got that um, gouache set as a gift and I wanted to, I did a, a few um, studies with it, you know, out in the field. And I really love the quality of the gouache. So I'm intimidated by regular watercolor because I've just, it's just never been pleasant to me. <laughs> it's been um, really hard. And, and I think because I was, I learned to paint with oils. When you work with watercolor, it's kind of like you have to flip your brain, brain around. Um, so, when I found the gouache, it was similar to working with oil for me. Um, so I wanted to explore how I could incorporate that in my practice with pastels. And I was really pleased with the quality of the gouache. And in the beginning, you'll see if you, on my Instagram, I've posted um, a number of videos of time lapse, lapse videos of the paintings I've done this month. And in the, in the beginning, you'll see how, like I've kind of struggled a little bit with figuring out the, how, you know, the consistency of the gouache, like, should it be thin like this, or should it be really thick? And I found this thin, um, thin wash to be um, the best for how I, I work with the pastels. So we have another question. Mm -hmm. um, she says, I'm wondering as a lifelong resident of Northern Lake George and a photographer, I'm often amazed mm -hmm. at the extraordinary images I capture in the natural landscape. I yeah. joke with my friends and family that if we saw a particular image in a painting, we'd think that oops, the artist got that wrong. That's not yes. what that's the sky mountains lighting really looks like. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. her question is, do you strive to capture what you see or what may resonate with others as real and true? That is such a great question. And I was talking about that earlier with as in regard to this piece. So I try to paint what I see but I also need to leave room for my own artistic expression. So, you know, if everybody painted the same thing, or if I took a photograph and then copied the photograph to a T, like a like photorealistic, 
I didn't, I mean, while that would be like an incredible <laughs> accomplishment, um, I want, I like to see the individual in um, fine art or paintings. Um, so that picture that I just showed was a brilliant day on Lake George. The, the water really was this intense blue. Like, like look at, look at, it was incredible incredible and the sun was, it was kind of midday so the sun was here and it was kind of doing the spotlight thing on the water like kind of glistening like that um and I took some reference photos I did a couple of little sketches and I'm and I remember looking at the pictures and thinking like nobody's ever gonna believe it was really this um brilliant um so in that piece I really tried to hold on to that and, and capture that feeling of um, just that bright electric blue. And that piece is like, it must really resonate with people because people are loving it. On, they, they absolutely love it on um, the reel that the, the time-lapse video that I did. Um, it's just, it's been seen by over 25,000 people. Um, so, yeah, I do try to paint what I see. And I encourage people when I teach workshops, I always encourage my students to, you know, when you're capturing something, whether it's an apple or a pear or reflections on the water, don't paint what you think it's supposed to look like. Just actually look and observe. And if you see an unexpected color like purple, put that down, you know, don't try to correct your, yourself or what you're seeing to say that doesn't look right or that won't look right. Um, and, and it'll work out. I remember uh, when I went to my first museum and I saw portraits in person, I was, you know, oftentimes like I've seen images in, in, catalogs, you know, and, and texts, and you see reproductions, and you don't really get to see all of the variety of color, texture. And I remember seeing a portrait, um, I believe it was, I um, can't remember the artist, but I remember being shocked at seeing green in the skin tone, in the shadows, um, seeing purple around the eyes. And so up close, it was really expressive, but when you really stood back and looked at it, it, it was really true. You know, it just felt right. Um, and if I were to approach a painting, a portrait, and I didn't have, or even if I had a reference photo and I wasn't working from life, I don't think I would instinctively pick green <laughs> for the skin tone um, or violet or, you know, any other color that's not, you know, peach or brown. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it is important. I know I kind of went off on a tangent on that, <laughs> but it was a really good question. Thank you. We have another question. What do you think about as you are painting? Meaning, are you thinking about edges or values or color temperature? That's another good question. Wow, you guys are great. <laughs> this is great. Um, in the beginning, I think I'm more conscious of what's happening. Um, so in the beginning, I did like a line drawing just to kind of establish some shapes in here. Um, and then, you know, so that is the composition. I'm thinking about composition in that moment. And then as I progress into the painting, I'm just kind of intuitively trying to um, get the right temperature for the area that I'm working on. So like in this area, it's kind of off into the distance. So it's, it's a little bit more cool. Um, 
And as you see this mountain in the foreground, it's a little bit more forward, so I have a little bit more warmth there. Um, but at some point, you know, especially if I'm not <laughs> kind of teaching or speak, you know, speaking while I'm working, I kind of don't think anymore. Like, or it's not conscious. Like, I kind of just get into um, a zone of painting and just kind of seeing what the painting needs and trying to respond to that. But I, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I'll, I'll have to like consciously try to do, to like maybe, you know, kind of think about what I'm doing as I'm, as I'm painting. But for the most part, it's just kind of like a, a push and pull. It's almost like I'm having like a conversation with the piece. I guess, trying to figure out what it needs, <laughs> what it doesn't need. Um, just instinctively, does it look right? Does it feel right? So another so question is, what's the difference between gel gouache and regular? So the gel gouache is, it is kind of, um, it's moist, like all the time. Um, whereas the um, regular gouache is dry. And um, yeah, so I, I'm not sure what in it keeps it um, moist, but it is like the, the kit that I have, you can see that the colors are kind of glistening. Whereas with my regular gouache, which I don't have um, handy right now, it just looks like little dry um, pads of color. So another question is, how would the finished piece be mounted or framed? It's another great question. And I have an example I can show you. So let's see, this is a, Oh, this one doesn't have, oh, this one has glass. Hang on. <laughs> so this is a piece, um, this is a painting from Cascades from a couple of creative Februarys ago. Um, it is framed under with spacers. So the spacer keeps it off the glass. And then I have um, museum glass on it. That's anti-glare and anti-reflective. It's kind of, you can kind of see it that way. When I hold it this way, you see my lights above, but kind of like that. And then it's mounted on this piece of foam core. Sometimes I mount it on gator board, which is a more solid um, backing. And then usually I put like a um, dust cover here and then wire and frame it. I used to frame my pastels with mat, with mat boards. And just for cost effectiveness, actually it doesn't really, because the from when, when you figure out the spacers and the museum glass, it's um, you know, it, it it's um it's it's an investment, let's say. Um, but I I tend to like the way my work looks without the mat. So it's really a personal preference. Oh, what you wanna do with that. Now, there's some pieces though that I think um, really the mat, if you wanted to kind of give it a more bold statement, a mat can be really good um, to kind of give some space around a piece. But these, these small pieces that I do, they're, they're kind of intimate and I like, um, I like them to just kind of be in their, their frame without any other distraction around them. So are there, other artists, historical or those working um, today that you find inspirational that have um, somehow influenced your work? Oh, absolutely. There are 
um, artists who are no longer with us that have inspired me. So um, the first one, of course, I mean, many people who grew up in the 80s, if you're an artist, most likely you watch Bob Ross on TV. <laughs> he was kind of like my first introduction to landscape painting. So prior to that, you know, going back to when I was young, I always drew. So I always use whatever art supplies I had, crayons or um, pencil and paper. So I always did a lot of drawings. I would draw faces and I did paper dolls for my friends. Um, when painting on PBS, I probably got. Um, and I just, I loved his um, mood. Like he was just, he put you in such a, in a great mood. And for him, landscape painting was kind of like this meditation. And I later found out that he was like a tough, you know, Marine, or he was in some form of, um, that he was in some form of military. And he was just, you know, it was just, I feel like the painting for him was just this peaceful, meditative um, thing. And I, I really, that really resonated with me. And when I got older and I went to, you know, the museums and I, and I got books on paintings, of course, the Impressionists um, were always, I uh, was always attracted to their work. Um, I've always been appreciative of landscape painting. Um, and contemporary artists, I'm surrounded by a lot of brilliant painters. My good friend, Kate Edwards, who is, she's my birthday buddy. Actually, the first year that we did Creative February, Kate and I did it together. And she's um, done it, done Creative February with me every year since. Um, she's, I'm always, you know, sending her things that we're, I'm working on to get her opinion. You know, we kind of go back and forth that way. Um, her work is, is brilliant. She's, um, she does landscape. She, she actually, she paints anything. <laughs> She's pretty incredible that way. She can paint landscapes, she can paint portraits. She did a few portraits for Creative February that I'm, I just keep going back to because they're just so amazing. Um, and there are other painters that I've connected with through the internet. So we've never met in person, but they're, I followed their work um, for years and, you know, they just have um, had an influence on, on me. So I feel, you know, artists contemporarily, we're all influenced by, by other artists, by what other artists are doing. And you might see someone do something and say, wow, that looks interesting. I wanna try that. Um, but it's important to kind of, you know, you can be inspired by other people, but it's important to kind of find your own voice. Um, Wolf Conan is, is another artist that, whose work I love. It's, he was an abstract ex expressionist. He worked also with oils and pastels. And unfortunately he passed away um, early to in 2020. Um, but his work is, resonates with me too, because he, he paints with, or painted just with almost just like, it just seems easy. <laughs> when you look at his work, it just seems like he's so expressive. Like he just steps up his easel, goes out, whether he's painting from life or in his studio and just really just, um, plays it looks like he's he's playing and experimenting with color um and i and i love that and there's there's ma many many more many many more painters who've influenced me over the years so um we have another question asking about what brand of wash artist quality is the best and can you seal your painting when you're done um, it's another good question. So I only have experience with two brands 
Kyoto, that's the one that's regular. And this, this um, other one is the Himi, Haimi, I think that's how you say it. So those are two that I have experience with, but like Winton, Winton, Grumbacher, they all make gouache. And I know other artists have had success with those brands as well. So I would suggest if you're new to gouache, just buy like the three primary colors plus white um, in an inexpensive set and just try it out first. And then if you really like it, then you can you know, explore other options. So do you, do you seal your painting oh, seal. and then would you ever mount without glass? Um, no, I would never mount without glass um, because the painting, the pastel, um, it's a dry medium when, it, when, you, when it's all said and done, even though I'm using a wet medium on the bottom, um, it's a dry medium and I do not fix the pastel, meaning I don't use like a fixative that I spray on the surface to lock in the colors. Um, I tried doing that once and had a really awful experience, experience with that. So um, this paper that I use also really doesn't require a fixative. I know some artists use a working fixative. So as they're painting, they may wanna lock in an area and so they may spray that and then continue working on top. Um, I find that this paper that I use, because it's, it's sanded, it really holds the pastel um, and I don't need to fix it. So it really needs to though be behind glass because if you had this, you know, it's kind of hanging on the wall without um, protection over it. Somebody can walk by and sm smudge it. Um, there was one artist that I saw who did these large scale pastel drawings and he chose not to um, put glass on them. And they were exhibited in a, in a show. <laughs> and I was just kind of in awe that he was that brave. Um, but there was something, I guess it was a part of the show, something about the impermanent. He wanted it to be impermanent. And I, I don't know, I, I want mine to be permanent. So I, I choose glass. So Natalie is asking, are you using the same blue in the water as in the sky? Um, yeah, I'm using a, a bunch of blues, but I'm trying to keep, um, keep the water pretty soft. I'm gonna be putting a, a bunch of grays on there too um, because of the what's going on with the reflection. It's a little too... You'll see, like I'll pick up a color and I'll try it. And then if it doesn't work, I'll try something else. So that's pretty dark. My reference isn't as dark, but I want to do some layers. So I'd mentioned before, you know, with oils that I like to work from dark to light. So I work similarly with, with the pastels. So you as see, you I'm can see in the chat, we have just a few more minutes. So if there are any other questions um, that you'd mm -hmm. like to ask Keith, please pass them along. Um, oh, wow. That went by really fast. <laughs> <laughs> it did. We have one comment. She says, I just want to say thank you so much before this ends. Oh, thank you. Thank you all so much for, for joining and being interested in, in what I'm doing here in my little corner. Um, I do appreciate all the wonderful questions. So 
great. It's so great to do these things because it, it allows me to be really thoughtful and um, think about things that I, you know, I, I normally don't. Um, so I do appreciate, the, you know, the questions and the, and the feedback. And I will send a finished image of this piece um, to Laura and I'll also post it on my Instagram so you'll be able to see it, um, you know, how I kind of resolve it from where we end. Um, yeah, this is really fun. <laughs> I really, really enjoyed all the questions. We're getting a lot of very enthusiastic thank yous. <laughs> and this, this really has been wonderful, being able to see into your artistic process, um, especially for those of us who don't have that sort of talent. <laughs> it's, it's really wonderful to see this image starting to come to life. Oh, thank you. Know, you. It comes together. Thank you. Yeah, I always say that, you know, like, paintings go through their different phases and we're leaving this in kind of like the awkward teenage phase <laughs> but I promise you eventually it will come into its own and blossom into a not so awkward young adult maybe <laughs> I don't know <laughs> um we do have we do have one question can you repeat the name of the gouache you mentioned um the, they did not get to hear the name of the, the product. Yes. Yep, you see it here. And then the other, let me just make sure I'm telling you the right thing. Yeah. I'm just searching for it. Um, I think it's called Koto, but maybe I'm wrong. I don't have the brand um, handy. I don't have my set handy. But I will. Um, yeah, it's not. It's not Koto. It's something else that starts with the K. Um, but I will I'll find it and I will um, let Laura know and she can share it when she shares the the link to the recording. Thank you very much to Keith. This has been really, really wonderful. Great. We are just about at eight o'clock. Okay. So we're going to okay. say, um, going to say goodbye. But I did want to say um, that uh, first of all, thank you again to Keith. Thank you to all of our participants for um, signing on, for sharing the program and those wonderful questions. It was really fascinating. Um, I do want to mention that this is part of our um, artist series uh, that we've started. It's the summer of 2023. We're opening a new exhibition, a long-term exhibition that is devoted to Adirondack art and design called uh, Artist and Inspiration in the Wild that will feature um, Takisa's work as well as many, many others. 
Uh, this is the first permanent exhibition devoted to this collection that um, the museum will um, have, and we're very excited about it. So this is one in a series of presentations we will offer that will show all sorts of different perspectives relating to art and to the collection uh, that we have at the museum. So thank you again for joining us. As Dekeese mentioned, there will be a recording of this program available along with the other programs uh, that we have on the website. So if you miss anything, you can tune in again. Um, we also will be having another uh, program on Wednesday. This is the last in the series of the Dax Dishes programs, uh, and that will feature the Iroquois White Corn Project. Next month um, in the art series, Laura Prieto will speak about women artists. And um, if you look in the um, uh, uh, in the chat, you'll find uh, information about that program and a link to register. So thank you again to Keith. This really was wonderful. Um, and thank you to all of our participants. And we hope we see you again. Have a good night. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye.